Chapter 4 Stanley felt somewhat dazed as the guard unlocked his handcuffs and led him off the bus. He'd been on the bus for over eight hours. Be careful, the bus driver said as Stanley walked down the steps. Stanley wasn't sure if the bus driver meant for him to be careful going down the steps or if he was telling him to be careful at Camp Green Lake. Thanks for the ride, he said. His mouth was dry and his throat hurt. He stepped onto the hard, dry dirt. There was a band of sweat around his wrist where the handcuff had been. The land was barren and desolate. He could see a few run-down buildings and some tents. Further away, there was a cabin beneath two tall trees. Those two trees were the only plant life he could see. There weren't even weeds. The guard led Stanley to a small building. A sign on front said, You are entering Camp Green Lake Juvenile Correctional Facility. Next to it was another sign, which declared that it was a violation of the Texas Penal Code to bring guns, explosives, weapons, drugs or alcohol onto the premises. As Stanley read the sign, he couldn't help but think, well, duh. The guard led Stanley into the building, where he felt the welcome relief of air conditioning. A man was sitting with his feet up on a desk. He turned his head when Stanley and the guard entered, but otherwise didn't move. Even though he was inside, he wore sunglasses and a cowboy hat. He also held a can of soda, and the sight of it made Stanley even more aware of his own thirst. He waited while the bus guard gave the man some papers to sign. That's a lot of sunflower seeds, the bus guard said. Stanley noticed a burlap sack filled with sunflower seeds on the floor next to the desk. I quit smoking last month, said the man in the cowboy hat. He had a tattoo of a rattlesnake on his arm, and as he signed his name, the snake's rattle seemed to wiggle. Used to smoke a pack a day, now I eat a sack of these every week. The guard laughed. There must have been a small refrigerator behind his desk, because the man in the cowboy hat produced two more cans of soda. For a second, Stanley hoped that one might be for him, but the man gave one to the guard and said the other was for the driver. Nine hours here and now nine hours back, the guard grumbled. What a day. Stanley thought about the long, miserable bus ride and felt a little sorry for the guard and the bus driver. The man in the cowboy hat spit sunflower seed shells into the waste paper basket. Then he walked around the desk to Stanley. My name is Mr. Sir, he said. Whenever you speak to me, you must call me by my name. Is that clear? Stanley hesitated. Uh, yes, Mr. Sir, he said, though he couldn't imagine that was really the man's name. You're not in the Girl Scouts anymore, Mr. Sir said. Stanley had to remove his clothes in front of Mr. Sir, who made sure he wasn't hiding anything. He was then given two sets of clothes and a towel. Each set consisted of a long-sleeve orange jumpsuit, an orange t-shirt and yellow socks. Stanley wasn't sure if the socks had been yellow originally. He was also given white sneakers, an orange cap and a canteen made of heavy plastic which unfortunately was empty. The cap had a piece of cloth sewn into the back of it for neck protection. Stanley got dressed. The clothes smelled like soap. Mr. Sir told him he should wear one set to work in and one set for relaxation. Laundry was done every three days. On that day, his work clothes would be washed. Then the other set would become his work clothes and he would get clean clothes to wear while resting. You are to dig one hole each day, including Saturdays and Sundays. Each hole must be five feet deep, five feet across in every direction. Your shovel is your measuring stick. Breakfast is served at 4.30. Stanley must have looked surprised because Mr. Sir went on to explain that they started early to avoid the hottest part of the day. No one's going to babysit you, he added. The longer it takes you to dig, the longer you'll be out in the sun. If you dig up anything interesting, you are to report it to me or any other counsellor. When you finish, the rest of the day is yours. Stanley nodded to show he understood. This isn't a Girl Scout camp, said Mr. Sir. He checked Stanley's backpack and allowed him to keep it. Then he led Stanley outside to the blazing heat. Take a good look around you, Mr. Sir said. What do you see? Stanley looked out across the vast wasteland. The air seemed thick with heat and dirt. Not much, he said, and hastily added, Mr. Sir. Mr. Sir laughed. <laughs> Do you see any guard towers? No. How about an electric fence? No, Mr. Sir. There's no fence at all, is there? No, Mr. Sir. You want to run away? Mr. Sir asked him. 
Stanley looked back at him, unsure what he meant. If you want to run away, go ahead. Start running. I'm not going to stop you. Stanley didn't know what kind of a game Mr. Sir was playing. See you looking at my gun. Don't worry, I'm not going to shoot you. He tapped his holster. This is for yellow spotted lizards. I wouldn't waste a bullet on you. I I'm not going to run away, Stanley said. Good thinking, said Mr. Sir. Nobody runs away from here. We don't need a fence. Know why? Because we've got the only water for a hundred miles. You want to run away, you'll be buzzard food in three days. Stanley could see some kids dressed in orange and carrying shuffles dragging themselves towards the tents. You thirsty? asked Mr. Sir. Yes, Mr. Sir, Stanley said gratefully. Well, you better get used to it. You're going to be thirsty for the next 18 months. Chapter 5 There were six large grey tents, and each one had a black letter on it. A, B, C, D, E, or F. The first five tents were for the campers. The councillors slept in F. Stanley was assigned to D tent. Mr. Pendansky was his councillor. My name's easy to remember, said Mr. Pendansky as he shook hands with Stanley just outside the tent. Three easy words, pen, dance, key. Mr. Sir returned to the office. Mr. Pendansky was younger than Mr. Sir and not nearly as scary looking. The top of his head was shaved so close it was almost bald, but his face was covered in a thick, curly black beard. His nose was badly sunburned. <laughs> Mr. Sir isn't really so bad, said Mr. Pendansky. He's just been in a bad mood ever since he quit smoking. The person you've got to worry about is the warden. There's only really one rule at Camp Green Lake. Don't upset the warden. Stanley nodded as if he understood. I want you to know, Stanley, that I respect you, Mr. Pendansky said. I understand you've made some bad mistakes in your life, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But everyone makes mistakes. You may have done some bad things, but that doesn't mean you're a bad kid. Stanley nodded. It seemed pointless to try and tell this counsellor that he was innocent. He figured everyone probably said that. He didn't want Mr. Penn Dansky to think that he had a bad attitude. I'm going to help you turn your life around, said his counsellor. But you're going to have to help too. Can I count on your help? Yes, sir, Stanley said. Mr. Penn Dansky said, good, and he patted Stanley on the back. Two boys, each carrying a shovel, were coming across the compound. Mr. Pendansky called to them. Rex, Alan, I want you to come and say hello to Stanley. He's the newest member of our team. The boys glanced wearily at Stanley. They were dripping with sweat and their faces were so dirty that it took Stanley a moment to notice that one kid was white and the other black. What happened to Bath Bag? asked the black kid. Lewis is still in the hospital, said Mr. Pendansky. He won't be returning. He told the boys to come and shake Stanley's hand and introduce themselves like gentlemen. Hi, the white kid grunted. That's Alan, said Mr. Pendansky. My name's not Alan, the boy said. It's Squid, and that's X-Ray. Hey, said X-Ray. He smiled and shook Stanley's hand. He wore glasses, but they were so dirty that Stanley wondered how he could see out of them. Mr. Pendansky told Alan to go to the rec hall and bring the other boys to meet Stanley. Then he led him inside the tent. There were seven cots, each one less than two feet from the one next to it. Which one was Lewis's cot? Mr. Pendansky asked. Bath bag slept here, said X-Ray, kicking at one of the beds. All right, Stanley, that'll be yours, said Mr. Pendansky. Stanley looked at the cot and nodded. He wasn't particularly thrilled about sleeping in the same cot that had been used by someone named Bath bag. Seven crates were stacked in two piles at one side of the tent. The open end of the crates faced outward. Stanley put his backpack, change of clothes and a towel in what used to be Barfbag's crate. It was at the bottom of the stack that had three in it. Squid returned with four other boys. The first three were introduced by Mr. Pendansky as Jose, Theodore and Ricky. They called themselves Magnet, Armpit and Zigzag. They all have nicknames, explained Mr. Pendansky. However, I prefer to use the names their parents gave them. The names that society will recognise them by when they return to become useful, hard-working members of society. It ain't just a nickname, X-Ray told Mr. Pendansky. He tapped the rim of his glasses. I can see inside you, Mum. You've got a big, fat heart. The last boy either didn't have a real name, or else he didn't have a nickname. Both Mr. Pendansky and X-Ray called him Zero. You know why his name's Zero? asked Mr. Pendansky. 
because there's nothing inside his head. <laughs> he smiled and playfully shook Zero's shoulder. Zero said nothing. And that's Mum, a boy said. Mr. Pendansky smiled at him. If it makes you feel better to call me Mum, Theodore, go ahead and call me Mum. He turned to Stanley. If you have any questions, Theodore will help you out. You got that, Theodore? I'm depending on you. Theodore spit a thin line of saliva between his teeth, causing some of the other boys to complain about the need to keep their home sanitary. You're all new here once, said Mr. Pendansky, and you all know what it feels like. I'm counting on every one of you to help Stanley. Stanley looked at the ground. Mr. Pendansky left the tent, and soon the other boys began to file out as well, taking their towels and change of clothes with them. Stanley was relieved to be left alone, but he was so thirsty he felt as though he would die if he didn't get something to drink soon. Hey, uh, Theodore, he said, going after him. Do you know where I can fill my canteen? Theodore whirled and grabbed Stanley by his collar. My name's not Theodore, he said. It's Armpit. He threw Stanley to the ground. Stanley stared up at him, terrified. There's a water spigot on the wall of the shower stall. Thanks, Armpit, said Stanley. As he watched the boy turn and walk away, he couldn't for the life of him figure out why anyone would want to be called Armpit. In a way, it made him feel a little better about having to sleep in a cot that had been used by somebody named Bathbag. Maybe it was a term of respect.